Okay, so this presentation, we're going to go over the endocrine system. It's the body system and the organs that are responsible for releasing hormones. Let's go ahead and get started. So as I start out on the endocrine system, for now I can just say that it helps to control growth, helps control our development, and our ability to respond to the environment. One thing you can see from the picture is that the glands or the organs are physically disconnected. It's not like this picture right here of the digestive system where the esophagus connects to the stomach, the stomach connects to the small, uh, to the small intestine. It's not like that. When we look at the endocrine system, the glands are physically disconnected. The glands, again, are the major organs of the endocrine system. And glands ultimately release hormones. You've probably heard of adrenaline, the hormone called adrenaline. Well, those, that's the hormone released by the adrenal glands. So all glands release hormones, and hormones are the chemical signals that move throughout our blood. And so our endocrine system releases hormones that travel through our blood and ultimately will end up at a target cell. And the hormones will direct that target cell to uh, respond in some kind of way, depending on the hormone. So hormones ultimately attach to a receptor that's found on a target cell. So here comes a hormone and it just attached to this receptor. See how the triangular shaped pieces fit? Well, this target cell, now that it's received the, uh, the hormone, this target cell will be stimulated to producing various proteins that the cell needs. So we'll talk more about these in just a moment, but ultimately there are two categories of hormones that I want to mention, steroid hormones and non-steroid hormones. So the first category of hormones I want to mention are called steroid hormones. And one thing I, I want to mention is, is that steroid hormones are naturally produced by the body. And in my animation here, we have a secreting cell secreting or releasing steroid hormones into the blood. Well, let's follow those hormones and see where they're going. So when we look at where are those steroid hormones going, in my animation you can see the steroid hormone is bouncing off of a non-target cell receptor. The receptor has a triangular shape to it and my steroid hormone in the animation is more round. So hormones don't match to every cell. Hormones match to very specific cells. And in this case, a steroid hormone is going to attach to a receptor that's actually located inside the cell. So steroid hormones can actually pass through the phospholipid bilayer, and that's what you just see happening. And so the steroid, ha the steroid hormone is attached to a receptor inside the target cell. The receptor and the steroid hormone will go into the nucleus, which will start a bunch of chemical reactions, and allow this target cell, it'll stimulate the target cell to producing proteins that are needed by the body. So the other category of hormones are called the non-steroid hormones. And just like the steroid hormones, non-steroid hormones are naturally produced by the body. And so the animation looks very much the same so far. I have a secreting cell. The word secreting means to release. I have a secreting cell here releasing non-steroid hormones into the blood. Well, let's see where they go. So when we follow the non-steroid hormone, we're going to see in a moment that it's going to attach to a receptor on the surface of the target cell, and here it comes. So the non-steroid hormone has attached to a receptor on the surface of the target cell. The non-steroid hormone never actually does enter the cell. What the non-steroid hormone does is that it initiates a series of chemical reactions. For instance, Chemical reaction A will be triggered, which leads to chemical reaction B, which leads to chemical reaction C, and the products eventually make their way into the nucleus, and the products will activate genes in the nucleus, which will cause the target cell to send out and create a bunch of proteins. So the end result is kind of the same in that uh, non-steroid hormones, as well as steroid hormones, trigger the target cells into making proteins.
So now I want to start going over the major glands of the endocrine system. And let's start with the hypothalamus. It's in the brain and it releases hormones that will stimulate the pituitary gland, which is just beneath it. So hormones of the hypothalamus will travel through the blood to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland will respond by releasing growth hormones. A great example of how glands communicate with other glands. The hypothalamus also helps to control body temperature. You know, the picture shows the ther a thermostat on a wall at someone's house set for 98.6 degrees. You know, that's about the average body temperature. And if we get too hot or too cold, the hypothalamus will respond by releasing hormones that will cause us to shiver when we're cold or sweat when we're too hot. So the hypothalamus is often kind of called the thermostat of the body. The next gland I want to mention is a great example of glands having more than one job. The pituitary gland, for instance, regulates water levels in the blood. If our blood becomes too thick, it's really hard to pump. So the pituitary gland will release hormones to help control the, the water content in our blood. Uh, another function of the pituitary gland will, is to relieve release growth hormones, which stimulate cell division and, and causes our cells to just physically grow larger. And this is important as we hit the puberty years of our life and then enter into the adulthood years of our life. So that's about the hypothalamus will send signals to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland will respond by releasing growth hormones. So the next gland I want to mention is in our throat area called the thyroid. And like most glands, it has a role to play in many processes. One important process is to help in, uh, in our metabolism and our digestion of food. You know, there's a couple hormones called the T3 hormone and the T4 hormone. And, and these hormones help to control our metabolism and adjust our rate of digestion. One that's not mentioned, there's a hormone called calcitonin which helps to lower calcium that's in our blood if our calcium levels get too high. There's another hormone called the parathyroid hormone that helps to raise calcium in our blood if our calcium levels, levels are too low. So again, a great example of how a gland has more than one purpose. So as we work our way down, we come to the chest area and there's a gland called the thymus. And the function of the thymus to, is to release hormones to help white blood cells mature to fight infection. Specifically, a type of white blood cells called T cells. And T cells are, are very important in the fighting off of bacteria and virus, viruses and pathogens. And the thymus will release a hormone called thymosin. And thymosin helps, again, these T cells to mature in order to fight infection. So the next gland I want to mention is called the pancreas and I hope you have a general idea that the pancreas helps to control the glucose levels or the sugar levels that are found in our blood. You know after meals the amount of sugar in our blood rises and so the pancreas will respond by releasing a hormone called insulin to bring the level of sugar or the level of glucose back to a normal level. Well, if there's ever times when our blood sugar is too low, then the pancreas will respond by releasing a hormone called glucagon, which will ri uh, raise, raise the sugar level back up to its normal level. Let's look at these two in a little more detail. So when glucose levels are high, and that's what you see in the picture right now, a person's just had a meal and their blood is full of G, which stands for glucose. When, a, when glucose levels are high, the pancreas will respond by releasing insulin, the letter I in my animation. The insulin is attaching to these little channels, these little doorways located on each cell. And when the cell channels receive the insulin, watch what happens next the insulin causes those channels to open and I hope you can predict what's going to happen now that the channels are open. Now that the channels have opened the glucose simply diffuses from a high concentration to a low concentration into the cells. That reduces or lowers the amount of sugar that's in the blood to a normal level. So the pancreas helped to control this by releasing insulin. What about the opposite when glucose levels are too low? Well, here's a picture of our liver. 
and our liver will receive the hormone called glucagon, which comes from the pancreas. Let's zoom on into this liver here. And here's a few cells of the liver, and the cells are receiving glucagon, which came from the pancreas. These cells of the liver, they're going to respond by releasing stored amounts of glucose into the blood. That will bring the low level back up to normal. So gluco glucagon brings levels up when they're too low. Insulin brings levels down when they're too high. Okay, so the next major gland I want to mention are called the adrenal glands and we have two of them one on top of each kidney and the adrenal glands help to control our fight or flight response I'll say more on that in just a moment well here's our heart and here's the normal heartbeat but in times of stress or in times of a threat let's say a near car accident or a suspicious character walking towards you in a dark alley what happens is the adrenal glands will release a hormone called adrenaline or also called epinephrine and this hormone epinephrine will cause our a faster heartbeat will cause our heart to our pulse to increase this causes our fight or flight response it increases our breathing makes us more alert increases our blood pressure circulates oxygen all throughout our body faster and then we can either choose to fight the threat or flight and by flight it just means run away it doesn't literally mean take to the air and fly but in times of threat or danger the adrenal glands will release epinephrine to activate our fight or flight response. If we work our way down, we come to the male and female gonads or sex organs. Well, let's look at the female gonad first, called the ovaries. Women have two ovaries, and the ovaries will release hormones that will influence sexual development. So around the age of puberty, the pituitary gland will send out hormones to the ovaries. The ovaries will respond and send out hormones called estrogen and progesterone. These are the hormones that will cause sexual development to occur. And so here's a list of some of the features of, or some of the effects, excuse me, of estrogen. Development of the ovaries starts the menstrual cycle. Development of breasts, you may have heard of a condition called osteoporosis where women age their bones become less dense and are more likely to to break so this is because women as they age produce less and less and less estrogen let's move on to the to the men next so in men the male sex organ or the male gonads are called testes and just like in women around the age of puberty men will receive hormones from the pituitary gland. The hormones from the pituitary gland will cause the testes to release a surge of testosterone, which is the main hormone released by the testes. And here's a list of some of the effects that testosterone has in male sexual development. Stimulates the production of sperm cells, increases muscle mass, leads to the growth of facial hair. So as, uh, as boys hit puberty, the testes will send, send out testosterone, which will have some of these effects that you see right here, and cause the uh, development of sexual features. So before we're done with this presentation, I want to kind of show you an example of how glands communicate with other glands. For instance, shivering. Three glands here, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and thyroid. The hypothalamus acts like the thermostat and it'll sense that you are cold and it will release a hormone down to the pituitary gland. I'm just going to call it hormone A for the sake of this animation. The pituitary gland will receive hormone A and the pituitary gland will respond by releasing hormone B through the bloodstream down to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland will receive hormone B and then respond by sending out hormone C all throughout the body. Hormone C is the hormone that actually causes shivering. This is just a great example of what I mean by glands communicating with other glands in order to achieve a purpose. Shivering would cause the person to generate heat to warm, to warm themselves.
So now that we've kind of reached the end, go ahead and pause this video and try to label what is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So now that you had a chance to label these, let's check your answers. Did you call part A the hypothalamus, part B the pituitary gland, part C the thyroid gland, part D the thymus, part E the adrenal glands, part F the pancreas, part G the ovaries, and part H the testes. Let's move on to the next group of questions. Just like a moment ago, pause the video, pause the video and try to answer these nine questions right here. Let's see how much you've learned. I'm going to go over the answers in three, two, one. So which gland releases uh, growth hormone? I hope you said that's the pituitary gland. Which one controls the water level in the blood? Well, that's the pituitary gland as well. Which one increases our alertness via the fight or flight response? Well, that's the adrenal glands. Which one controls the level of sugar in our blood? Well, that would be the pancreas. Which one controls the level of calcium in the blood? That would be the thyroid gland. Which one releases glucagon? That would be the pancreas again. Which one helps uh, to develop white blood cells? Well, that would be the thymus. Which one releases the hormone called epinephrine? That would be the adrenal glands. Epinephrine is also called adrenaline. And which one helps to control our metabolism? That would be the thyroid gland. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. You know, here's a, a practice quiz that you can try again at home. Pause the video, try to answer these questions. If you're in my biology class, I'd be happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. So go ahead and pause the video. Good luck.